Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 582. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. For the moment, I'm still Gavin Ashenden on Friday the 13th, 2020, but who knows for how much longer. We want to welcome you guys to another show, and uh, <laughs> glad you guys could make it. If you're actually watching, you have survived another week with the audacious coronavirus out there. It is a serious disease, depending on your age group and any medical conditions you have, like diabetes or uh, cardiovascular disease, or if you're aged like myself. Uh, and we do ask that you uh, stay out of crowded areas and keep safe because we want you here Monday when we have our next show and Friday after that. We want you to go all the way at least to episode 1000 because we love our audience and I don't want to see viewership falling in the next couple of months because you guys were not watching where you were in public. Before we get started, we need you as faithful viewers to uh, like us on Facebook and YouTube. You click George, what are you doing there? You got I'm breaking to turn data, off the phone. <laughs> turning off the phone. We do that before the show. Uh, that's all right. So, like us on Facebook and YouTube. Share this episode with everybody you know because we're going to talk about important things with coronavirus in the church. Kind of part two. We talked about that on our last show as well. We got lots of good reviews, talks, and comments. Please comment on the show. If you are an expert in disease and germs and stuff like that, I would like to interview you. And uh, please put a, uh, a comment on how to contact you in the comment section on YouTube. I'd be happy to do an interview with you. What else do we need to talk about? Oh, we do a podcast as well. This is recorded in two formats, video and podcast format. Please go to the show notes on YouTube to get the link to download the podcast. And Gentlemen. Comments, Kevin. Comments, yeah? Kevin. Yeah, yeah. Comment. I mean, mention the importance of comments. Very important. I mean, the show continues in the comments. We, I click the stop button. I do my little edits. I add the credits. I upload it. And then the show starts all over again with what people think about what we said. They have their own opinions. Sometimes they correct us. Sometimes they go, I wasn't sure of Kevin's pronunciation of that word. That's just me. I'm you know, not, not a master of pronunciation. And so... I love how, you know, not but three hours after I've uploaded an episode, there's 150 comments. This is where the show takes off, continues, and uh, we appreciate that very, very much. Breaking news. Presiding Bishop Michael Curry says dioceses may close because of the coronavirus. Breaking news number two, it is expected not to affect the Episcopal Church's ASA. So let's talk about what's going on with the coronavirus here in the Episcopal Church first, George. Why are we allowing the diocese to close? Well, Michael Curry, uh, the House of Bishops are meeting right now, but they're, they're doing it remotely via video link. Uh, and last and night, last night, Michael Curry released a statement saying that diocese has his blessing to shut down operations. Uh, Washington, D.C. Diocese, Virginia, Kentucky, uh, North Carolina, I'm sorry, Lexington, uh, Diocese of Lexington, the Diocese of North Carolina, uh, for a start, have issued directives to their congregations to shut down operations until uh, the end of March, and then they'll reassess it, and people in the diocese and offices will work from home. So the public uh, operations of the Episcopal Church uh, will close. Now, I don't know whether that means the doors of parishes will be locked or that just we won't be parish worship. There's a lot to be worked out. How do, what does this look like? Now, what also Bishop Curry was saying that he, there's not going to be a nationwide Episcopal Church uh, policy because uh, so, certain parts of the country are free from the coronavirus and don't really have the issues that uh, other places uh, have. Why this is such a a pressing issue was that in February, uh, 500 Episcopal clergy and lay leaders attended a conference in Louisville, Kentucky for the Consortium of Endowed Episcopal Parishes, which are the churches that have inherited money. And it's basically a, co a, a conference how to invest wisely, all this and that. Well, four uh, rectors who attended that meeting have 
come down with the coronavirus. One in All Saints Beverly Hills, uh, Church of the Epiphany in Manhattan, uh, Trinity in Fort Worth, Texas, and oh, the fourth. Uh, uh, well, it'll come to me. But there are four who have the coronavirus, and so there are people who know people who are getting sick with this. Well, you say four who have the coronavirus. I'm sure many more have it that went to it, but four are showing severe symptoms in our house. There are four priests who are hospitalized. Yes. Now, a good news way of looking at that is that there are 496 people who are at the same conference who haven't been hospitalized. Mm -hmm. And there are four who they fell sick immediately upon their return from the conference at the end of February. And so now that's two weeks ago. And they're in hospital now. Nobody else that we know of is. So what what it says is that either this, well, I'm not an epidemiologist. I don't want to make, uh, I just can only report what I know. I don't want to make assumptions about the facts that are based on my ignorance, I'm afraid. Well, it, I mean, that's one of the things with the show. We understand theology pretty well, but we're not doctors. We're not uh experts on uh, the latest fad on Facebook, which uh, it's either guns or, or it's coronavirus in the last uh, couple weeks. Uh, uh, but no, Kevin, Gavin is a doctor. He's just not a real doctor. <laughs> we can we, do that. We <laughs> <this last week. laughs> is that like a chiropractor? Um, <laughs> Gavin, a uh, Italy closed down. France closing schools the wife of the leader of France diagnosed with coronavirus, the wife of Justin Trudeau uh, diagnosed with uh, coronavirus. President Bolsonaro of Brazil. Brazil's president just uh, diagnosed an hour ago. President Trump is going to declare a national emergency, which will give him the right, if he wants to, to uh, introduced the Stanford Act, which allows him to shut down states, to uh, shut down uh, travel between states in order to stop this virus. China, because they're communist and totalitarian, were able to shut this down by closing down movement and putting everybody who they suspected to be infected or possibly infected in hospital or in lockdown. Uh, is it too late for Europe? Europe are taking different attitudes. So the UK yesterday decided it wasn't going to uh, impose any government restrictions on people, uh, partly because the algorithms that they have mapped the spread of the virus from suggest that to do so wouldn't be effective. What they really mean is there's, there's not a lot you can do. It's partly about supply and demand for hospital beds. Uh, it's partly about people panicking and being sensible. What, what the British government seem to have done is to go for, for the nudge. So Boris Johnson has, has, has looked at us in an avuncular way and said, I'm, I'm really sorry, this could be a difficult spring for you. You may lose more loved ones than you expected. And <laughs> hoped Jeez. by that means <laughs> to, to give people just enough anxiety to change their behavior, <clears throat> but not to, not to force change of behavior by the government. At the same time, the government had just told us that local elections are going to be postponed, which means people won't be able to exert the, some of their democratic rights. Um, and that, that causes me some anxiety. I, I still think that this throws us as Christians back on who we really are and what we really believe. Uh, some, some rather vigorous priest tweeted, it was only two weeks ago that we said to our people, dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And now we're trying to soften the blow. But, <laughs> but um, the, the fact, I, I think that for Christians, um, well, there's another theological argument going on. Uh, I, I was asked by a friend of ours, Jules Gomez, if I would comment on a bishop saying, God doesn't chastise. This is not divine chastisement. Um, and uh, although I don't think it is divine chastisement as such, I think there's an element to which uh, we have to say that we live in a society that has ignored God, repudiated God, decided to do things uh, as it wants. The, the, the awful stewardship of the wet markets in China 
where different species are brought together in 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 conditions that are diabolical for the animals at any rate has backfired on people uh, whether god is chastising us actively or whether he's allowing us to suffer for our own sins passively doesn't strike me as being a huge difference but but the idea as one theologian bishop a catholic bishop in rome wanted to do was say god hasn't visited this god has nothing to do with this this is this is just the mechanism of 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 flawed humanity i, I think what that does is it turns god into a kind of therapist you know your your god would never do anything anything to to, to harm constrict or undermine you but actually it, it, right throughout the scriptures we have an active god who gets involved in human affairs Choose this day whom you will serve, life or death. And I think Christians should take this opportunity and say to the rest of humanity, actually life is dangerous, but it's not just dangerous in the body, it's dangerous in the soul. And this is a moment when you really, whether you're going to live or die soon, you need to reevaluate your priorities. You are contingent. You, you can't protect yourselves from death. That's the most alarming thing, I think, to the secular mind. There's nothing they can do about this. Uh, and although they're trying to take precautions and be sensible, uh, I think this is a moment for Christians to say, we have the key to life and death and we can live life with a degree of confidence, irrespective of the way in which a virus compromises our mortality. Let's show you how to do it. And therefore, we, are not, we should not be afraid. We should not close things down. We should live life to the full, even in the face of a pandemic. That's what it is to have faith, I think. George, here in America, we have televangelists like Kenneth Copeland who wet their hand in holy water and, and pray for the nation to uh, be done with this horrible coronavirus. And uh, through Kenneth Copeland's stripes, we're healed. You know, it's amazing to see the theology that goes about when there is national crises, everything from Y2K through SARS, through coronavirus, as to how people respond, whether it's a televangelist, whether it's a Roman Catholic bishop, whether it's the Pope uh, or other leaders in the Christian church around the world. They, 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 they preach about ashes to ashes, but they're never prepared for it when it happens. Well, Kevin, my favorite is uh, the Fed Food and Drug Administration has issued a cease and desist order to Jim Baker of Jim and Tammy Faye Baker fame. Yes. He, he has a cable TV ministry, and he was selling a, a product uh, that was guaranteed uh, to fight medically and spiritually the coronavirus to keep you safe. Now, I don't know, uh, Gavin, would this come under the uh, uh, category of indulgence or relics? or how would this... <laughs> I was thinking this sounded to me very much like the uh, medieval trade in relics expanding through Pentecostalism, George. Mm. I, think, I think theological and spiritual abuse looks the same wherever you come across it. <laughs> uh, we just got to alert that uh, Trump is uh, declaring the national emergency and the mayor of Miami has tested positive. I mean, this is just breaking stuff as we do our show. And you know, it's it's hard to do a show about this when we know that people are watching this with anxiety. We don't want you to watch us in, with anxiety. We want you to watch this with the, the knowledge that God is unshaken in this and that your faith should be unshaken in this. God didn't change. Well, this is having a concrete... Met... I didn't say God is in control. I just met a wonderful old lady on, on a walk after uh -huh. I had been sweating at my typewriter for, for six hours. I went for a walk and met an old lady on the hills. I say old lady, she was my age. And, <laughs> and we said, I, don't, I have no idea if she was Christian or not, although I blessed her and, and used a bit of Christian language. And she said, you know, the great thing about this is our children are safe. It's just us. And we, you know, of all the, all the kind of pandemics that could happen, this is not one to complain because our our children shrug this off, and we we might go and we we might not go. Um, and I was I was saying I was a bit worried because the head of the Italian uh, Medical Defense Council at sixty seven had just been carried off and died. And she said, "Yes, but you you don't know whether he was a chain smoker to the age of thirty or whether he had high blood pressure." Um, and so we 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 encourage each other by saying our children are safe. We've lived a good life, and we shook hands when we left <laughs> as a sign of confidence. Um, I dare say we'll both wash them when we come home. Uh, uh, I know, I know. 
but you know of, of all the things that could happen compared to Ebola or some of the more dreadful things that have taken place um, this will carry off some people. Uh, I was at a, at a singing in a choir last night. We were singing the Messiah. And I thought, oh, this could be the last time I sing the Messiah, this side of heaven. Um, this, this is adding a bit of zest to life. Who knows? <laughs> we, have, we, we have to be ready to die, I think, and to, uh, and, and to, to live lives of confidence in, in, in God who saves us and welcomes us to eternal life. This life is provisional. This is the, there was that dreadful piece of new age graffiti which said you know live live life properly um this is not a practice run but it is a practice run that's yeah, exactly yeah, what yeah. it is for christians and i think we should look death and pandemic and plague in the face and and do it with confidence in the risen lord because we were given our lives as a gift anyway and and the people who are in real danger are the people who've had the chance to live their lives yeah. we can't complain too much we need to be good examples for the kids who are going to stick around um Gavin, if I could ask, do you think uh, this will give the Remain uh, crowd an opportunity to demand? <laughs> yes. because, uh, They've already started. Because, They've started you know, it already, George. That, you know, because it was the older people who uh, pulled Britain out of uh, the European Union, and if they all died off, well, hey, let's have another vote. Yeah, the, the, the brats have been saying, that, that, you know, you spoiled our future. You stole our future, you geriatric waste of space. Um, there are people in the more excitable edges of Twitter who are recording that their grandchildren have been unkind to them because of the Brexit vote. <laughs> I'm, I'm quite sure that there'll be some people, uh, depending on the mortality rate, who say, let's try and run this thing again. But, well, but you know, whether we may not be here to see it, George. <laughs> Let's see. Well, there was a famous uh, San Francisco LSD professor from the late 60s and 70s who said, never trust anybody over 35. And uh, it's my presumption now that I'm well into my 50s, I don't trust anybody under 35. Uh, they, they tend to vote socialist. They tend to think the world is fair. And if they can't, uh, if it isn't fair, they can legislate it into fairness. And uh, that's, that's quite a different concept than I was brought up with. Uh, uh, and then in a pandemic like this, I, I would just love to sit down and, and hear a leader like Ronald Reagan talk to us about uh, how a country should go on throughout uh, this type of pandemic where uh, I found Trump's response a little bit lackluster. I've listened to leaders in Europe and they seem to be lackluster. You know, I've heard Christian leaders and they're lackluster. Nobody has a, a great response to the fear they feel. Well, I think I think people are in shock because this has, as as all medical emergencies do, this really has blown up their expectations of their worldview. Uh, I don't want to be to lack compassion, and I've said I may be one of the first to go, but I I do think there's a lot to be said on our behalf for for attacking the utopian complacency that we are surrounded by and saying, look, you're not in control. You can't even manage pandemics, let alone build utopia and, the, and an equal society. So this really ought to be a moment for you to recalibrate what you're doing here, what the terms and conditions of our humanity are, and get back on your knees, thank God for your life, and prepare for judgment. Um, you know, I, if we were in the Middle Ages, our forebears would have made the most of this preaching opportunity as, as the, the ground under people's feet gives way. And the alternative is either despair or throwing yourselves into a God who proves to be wonderfully merciful and very close and ready to beckon us into immortality. Well, oh, heaven, oh. Not, not the Greek thing, heaven. <laughs> uh, one of the headlines here on the Drudge Report asks, is God unhappy with mankind? No, Very it, unhappy. Well, I mean, it was certainly this is the the standard question. Whether it was the Black Plague, whether it's Ebola, whether it's uh, HIV and AIDS, uh, is this God's judgment? We we kind of alluded to it before uh, a couple of months ago. When we we're talking about, but uh, I don't think this is God's judgment in any way, shape, or form. But what is the standard theology now? <laughs> George, you, you, I, it, I've George. talked too much. You'll, you'll go. <laughs> I don't like the question, uh, to be perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. I, don't think, I don't think it's a question that uh, uh, we can really answer because we can't know the mind of God. We can only know. Uh, we, we, it asks the question of what are our sources of revelation. And uh, 
such that we can make an assumption or distinction about how God is acting in a certain time, place, and point. Hmm. So, I mean, there's a wonderful sterile argument to be had hmm. about this, but to be perfectly frank, I'm not really interested in that. I'm interested in what do we do during a time of crisis. Not why is the crisis occurring, because the crisis is going to occur whether we like it or not. But how do we as Christians, as a church, as a, as a people uh, who know the truth about the world, how do we respond? How, he, this may be my personality, but how can this be an opportunity for us to tell the world about Jesus Christ and not, not to worry? It, I'm seeing it in my in local affairs. I had, uh, I had about 20% drop in attendance uh, last Sunday for the prior Sunday. Uh, I had uh, about a 50% drop of people attending our weekly uh, Lenten soup suppers. And it'll probably get worse because people are very scared. Well, if the church follows the world in heightening these fears and basically offers nothing but passing on CDC or government health guidelines, is it abdicating its responsibility to speak, as Gavin has rightly said, to deeper truths? That, that I'll, I'm going to pick on the Catholic Church because it's a lot of fun. Uh, but a, as I understand it, and I, I, can, I stand to be corrected, a functionary within the Diocese of Rome uh, shuttered all Roman Diocese of Rome Catholic churches. Not only stopped ma public worship, but closed the doors. And I think Pope Francis intervened to uh, rescind that, to allow people to come to churches to pray and meanwhile, the Greek Orthodox Patriarch in Athens was asked, uh, are you going to do what the Italian Catholic Church has done, which is uh, suspend public worship? And the Greek Orthodox Patriarch said, of course not. Uh, in a proper Orthodox uh, communion service, you, uh, the Holy Communion is uh, the body and blood of Christ. You're not going to get sick from it. Therefore, I mean, now a Catholic is a communion is not a proper communion service, so the Italians are doing the right things. But we Greek Orthodox who do it right, we're not in any danger. So uh, I always I just thought that was a wonderful example of orthodoxy at its best. But uh, what you know, I, but I, there I, is something to be said, even though it was said yeah. in our, even though it was not said as smoothly as it could have been, for the Greek Orthodox uh, archbishops' approach to this issue of dividing the world between the spiritual and the temporal and leaving the spiritual world not to be driven by temporal lunacy or frenzies. Well, I think you're right. And it's one of the great strengths of orthodoxy that it refuses to bow the knee to contemporary culture. Catholicism should have done the same thing. And as Kevin said earlier, I think they've just changed their mind and they've opened the churches back up. Either they listen to the Greek Orthodox patriarch or else they follow Anglican unscripted. But either way, <laughs> they've got the message and, and quite rightly so with this is, but we shouldn't, I guess we shouldn't be surprised. The church has for some while tottered between a secular materialist worldview and its, its miraculous supernatural roots in the New Testament and the lives of the saints. So this is an opportunity for us to recover our confidence in the kingdom of heaven and in, and in the spiritual life and to, to tread quite lightly on the earth because we're, we're going to die soon. I like what you said about saying to Kevin, it's the wrong question. Uh, is, you know, is this God, is the coronavirus God's judgment is the wrong question. The question ought to involve, is there going to be a judgment? Well, there is. How are you going to let the coronavirus virus prepare yourself for it? Well, hopefully by bringing you to your knees and a reevaluation of your life. Are you going to live or die biologically? Who knows? The real question is, are you going to live or die spiritually? <laughs> and so th what the church could do is to say, there are things we can't tell you about about virology, but we can tell you about your soul. Mm. And this is a very good moment to, to recalibrate the kind of life you live. At least that's how it's affecting me. Uh, and I, I think that's quite a sensible way of doing it. Of course, the other thing is, in Greek, judgment is crisis. So every time there's a crisis, there's a moment of judgment. In that sense, the coronavirus is a moment of crisis and judgment. And then it gives us the opportunity to make a decision uh, to live a better life. I, I think all three of us are agreed that we're not advocating a position that we are to tempt or to test God, 
by going out of our way to be unsanitary, unhygienic, uh, ignoring good common sense advice and everyday practices. I think we're, I, uh, I hope I speak for the three of us, but what we're saying is that we should not abandon all. Uh, oh, it's the other way. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, I, sorry, it's just, <laughs> Kevin, Kevin was, um, was, was sanitizing, was playing the, <laughs> sanitizing, play, playing the Shakespearean oh, I, fool and undermining George's wonderful <laughs> wisdom. George, start again. <laughs> that's, don't pay no attention to that man on the left of the screen. That's it. Well, for instance, uh, we're going to continue with our Latin study series. We're going to explore running it on Facebook Live and or filming it so that those who wish to see it who, who don't feel able to come. And we're not going to serve food from a potluck. We're going to have prepackaged snack type things. So if you're hungry, you can fiddle with cellophane and uh, interrupt your neighbors with that. But we're going to find ways to continue the life and work of the church while not being foolish. And uh, as I say, testing God by saying, look, we're so holy, we're so godly, that of course, anybody who comes to our, our, our study series they're there now holy and God will protect them from all illness. Uh, I don't think God works that way. But I think but it's... I, we need to find that right balance and not abandon the spiritual in this hysteria that we're seeing in the temporal world. I think it, the, the imagery is important. There's nothing worse than going to a church on a Sunday and seeing the sign on the door that says closed for coronavirus. I, I think that's the wrong imagery. That's the wrong marketing that's the wrong message to give to the world that there's reason there are reasons to close a church and one of them is disease and pestilence well i mean i just you know having been a christian now for the better part of 40 years i i don't get that i understand not attending a church because you have a cough cold or flu but i do not see why a church would close its doors in the, in the same respect. I just said, you know, I've filled out, I've written about, you can't see it well on the screen. I wrote uh, two dozen postcards this morning uh, to those people who I know are in town, who weren't here on Sunday, who I know are elderly and fearful, just assuring mm -hmm. them that if you need me, if you need us, we're here for you. Mm -hmm. But uh, for, mo for many older people, they're alone almost all day long. Mm -hmm. And the church is their focal point of social interaction and family connection and as well as spiritual uh it's it's where they find and meet god mm -hmm. in that community of the faithful uh, people where the sacraments are celebrated and the word is taught and for them to stay away is a big sacrifice but at the same time they're being scared to death by the television well and i think we need to reassure but also say to people you know, the mayor of Miami has the coronavirus. Miami is seven hours drive south. Uh, it's an exchange student has it in Gainesville, two and a half hours north. Yes, it's going to get here eventually, but we, we need not act as if the world has ended today. And this is a great time to engage the entire church. The old people are afraid. The young people are home from their schools, which are closed. Mm -hmm. The old people don't want to. Yeah, the old people don't want to go grocery shopping. They don't want to be in public where they're likely to get the virus. When they do go to the grocery stores, there's no toilet paper. There's no produce. There's no food. It would be nice if we could help engage the uh, teenagers and the younger generation to go shopping for the older people. To, um, and I'm using my daughter's idea. To, I don't think that I came up with this, this myself but to engage the younger generation and helping the older generation through this crisis. And it's a crisis in society, but it doesn't have to be a crisis in the church. Well, there's certainly a crisis of loneliness, one of the things that old people are going to experience, apart from fear of mortality, which is perfectly reasonable, uh, if sub-Christian, uh, is, uh, is loneliness. And I, I think if there's anything at all that can be done along the lines of Kevin's perceptive daughter, um, to to help people in the enforced isolation that's going to follow for some while, that that would be a very good thing, whether it's electronic or in in some other form. But yes, that's quite right. That's one of the background 
human uh, dilemmas we're going to, to try and find a way to, to deal with. The other dilemma, and I hate, I hate to be, I hate to be George, but this is going to, uh, this is going to bankrupt some dioceses. This is, um, <laughs> no, I'm serious. No, uh, I, I, I can think three or four in England and probably two here in America. Mm. Let, let's say uh, most, the average Episcopal church, I think has 69 uh, people on a Sunday. And those 69, the majority of people are 65 and older. If those people start coming to church for two or three months and people, when they're not there, they don't give. Or let's say we have, let's say just a 5% or 10% mortality of those affected and infected and whatnot. Whatever it is, this is going to, this has the potential for those churches that are barely treading water to put them underwater. And that will put some dioceses underwater. Um, this is really the, I think it was the economist or one of the, the Financial Times that says the real problem of the coronavirus of the Wuhan virus is not the health effects, it's the economic effects that we're going to see bankruptcies uh, just skyrocket in uh, bis small businesses and uh, industry. If, uh, if President Trump closes interstate commerce, all the food is going to rot in the fields in California and Florida. It's not going to be shipped to the north. When up in the north, grocery stores are going to be out of product and people are going to, it, it's not going to be a good, you know, the world is so, the United States is so internally tied together and the world is so inter tied together. Um, this is going to be a major test. Well, it's a major test yeah, on two different ways, because in the past, the church used to be the resource. 1940s, 1930s, when the, the Great Depression was wrong, around it was the churches that provided the soup kitchens it was the um the churches that had all the resources and networking to provide for the communities and the farmers the churches have lost that now it's now the government who's trying to step in and and uh take control well we don't want you guys to preach the gospel when you're you're giving out soup that's a shame so we'll do it for you and so the governments uh, all around the world have replaced the church and the church let them the church was a willing participant. Well, our, our congregations are kind of dwindling and stuff like that. And our farming communities are moving to the city. So, yeah, we'll let the government take over and provide these uh, basic human uh, services. One thing, uh, the spring crops, uh, I live in a rural area. You drive out of town and you see cows and you see fields and you see the planting. March, April, May, the first of the spring crops are picked. And the people who pick them don't live here. They're migrant workers. They move from Texas to California to North Carolina, down to Florida, based on the seasons. And most of them are uh, not United States citizens. And the economic system and structures we've established, rightly or wrongly, are based upon free, uh, trans free movement. A free flow of people, free, free flow of capital, free flow of goods. And in a, in a pandemic, uh, you can't have that. So how will this work itself out? Is President Trump right in taking dramatic action today and basically giving us two weeks of short, a sharp pain or in two months, they have the whole thing fall apart because everything is uh, collapsed. It's a, it worked in a communist country because they had the authority to do it. I don't know if uh, Trump would survive politically if he shut down interstate commerce. That would be, that, that's, a, that's a bridge beyond my understanding. Yeah, yeah, but how many people in Connecticut work in New York City? Yeah, I mean, how is that even yeah, possible? 16% yeah, of employed people in Connecticut work in one part of New York or another. So how, how do you deal with that? They take the train in, they drive in, they work in the latest outbreak area, New Rochelle, they go all the way to Manhattan, they uh, take the train into Grand Central. Uh, the, the biggest train stations we have are Fairfield, uh, New Haven, Groton, and they just fill up with people on a Monday morning and they go down to New York City. How do you stop that if you're gonna stop interstate travel? You can't. You can't shut, I mean, you're going to put the National Guard at the borders of uh, I-95 
going all the way to Florida? Here's a question that I haven't figured out yet. How can we as Christians, as individuals, how can we as churches take this crises of economic and psychological crises and health crises and proclaim the glory of Jesus Christ to the world? I don't want to be Pollyannish and say, where's the silver lining in all this? But where's the silver lining in all this? How can we respond so that the world sees Christians doing the work of Jesus Christ in, in the midst that of this chaos? Simple answer. Just look at, at Christian history. How did we handle the Black Plague? How did we handle all those other things? We were there. <clears throat> I yeah. was just going to mention the Black Plague. If I, yeah. if I, I was waiting to see if there was a natural way of doing it. So, so Kevin, it's thank here. you for no, doing no, no. it. <laughs> <laughs> you um, well, I mean, one of the things we know from history is that priests died in the Black Plague. But one of the reasons they died is they refused to leave their community. So they stayed in the community. They looked after people who were in who were in trouble, either in terms of comfort or practical things. They they didn't run. They didn't try to run away from death. And I think probably that's one of the best things we can do without falling into a, 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 a miraculous sanitizer um, uh, pretense that we're not afraid of death or that we know we will be spared it. We don't know those things. I think we ought to live as if we're not afraid of it. And I think that the crisis itself will do some of its work for us, George. It, it, it ought to um, have the effect of, of shocking people into reconsidering why life is so dangerous and whether this is all there is or not and at that point we need to be there able to explain the gospel and say the good news and to show why we're not afraid of dying or why we're why we're trying to be afraid of not of dying now, Kevin, it, Kevin is there anybody is there any christian leader that you've heard uh out so far who is somebody that we can point to and say he's doing it right she's doing it right I no, but but I'm going to tell you what I've done, and I'm not a Christian leader. Okay, we're going to point to, but right, I have largely up. not changed my habits. Uh, every Thursday night, there's a, a nearby restaurant about half a block from here. This is kind of a 55 plus community area. A lot of retired people live around here. It's a, it's a condo facility on the shore, and if they're not in Florida, they're here. We have a lot of snowbirds here. And we go to this little bar called the Bonfire. And every Thursday before 6 p.m., they have very inexpensive martinis. And they have appetizers you can have off the uh, menu that are very inexpensive. So Mrs. Anglican TV and myself like to go there every Thursday. And just because this virus has been spreading uh, throughout the uh, Northeast especially, has not stopped us from going there. We were there last night. Now, hold on. All of our neighbors were there as well. Nobody stops going for inexpensive martinis. And so uh, we went to Bonfire. It's just as full as it ever was on a Thursday night, whether it was going to be uh, a July weekend or whether it was going to be a March uh, 10th weekend. Uh, people have not... Uh, I, I would say unhealthy people hopefully have changed their uh, patterns, but uh, healthy 50-year-olds have not, as far as I can tell. So, Kevin, I'm taking away two things from your comment. One, that you think the uh, use of alcohol shouldn't be on your hands, but you should imbibe it. That's the prophylactic against disease. This is disease. named Corona for a reason. <laughs> and to, for me to, uh, to turn around the... Uh, numbers decline i should start serving alcohol at services or but you do have a have happy hour it's eucharist i i and i i'll be going to sunday service as well but i would recommend people uh in their 60s or with any health conditions if you're susceptible to moan if you've ever had pneumonia do not go to services for the next couple of weeks uh this is a respiratory disease and you, you will find yourself intubated in a week because you went to services. I do not recommend it for you. Uh, this is a nasty little um, disease. Unless you go to Greek Orthodox services. Yeah, with a, with a <laughs> Greek Orthodox, with a har r not. When they say it has a high r not, it means it's, it's very catchable, it's very contagious. Uh, this is more contagious than SARS. And it, it's just a messy disease you don't want to get. It's survivable especially when you live eight miles from Yale Hospital. But if, if you're in some community in the middle of Minnesota, you know, I'd be a little bit more careful. 
All right, so we've given people all the information they need, and we've done this in 43 minutes. We're, we're, you can't do any better than this. Uh, what's your schedule? Are you guys available for Monday or Tuesday? Tuesday works for me. All right, Gavin? If we're still here, if God yeah, willing. Yeah. If <laughs> God willing, ashes to ashes, we shall be here Monday. All right, so we'll do and, another and show for Monday. British Marian Festival, are you celebrating with your new blue background? Is that? Uh... Yeah, tell us about your new studio there, Gavin. <laughs> the, you guys are so cruel. Um, I, I've been very impressed. I've, I've decided that uh, since the spiritual level of my homilies is at a is at a fairly low level, I ought to try and compensate by by adding some technological color. So I thought, well, the 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 background is something I ought to uh, to deal with, and I've been looking. So I've got a tiny blue screen, and I'm hoping to try and find a way of projecting something exotic who knows like like the vatican perhaps on the background to uh to to to, to give myself technologically what i fail to provide spiritually <laughs> techies all right gentlemen uh we do ask that our audience keep us in our prayers we have uh busy weekends coming up and uh uh gavin and george are out there in in the fray of this ministry and then we ask that uh you uh, pray for protection of Anglican Unscripted and its co-host. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashend, and you've been listening to episode 582 of Anglican Unscripted. On Friday the 13th. Oh, on Friday the 13th of oh. 2020. Thank you, Kevin. No, no. Just, uh, now I'm scared. Now I'm really scared. Mm -hmm.